Hello, today I would like to share with you an update about the JEC inhibitors in Algeria. There are several factors that contribute to our decision about choosing a treatment for our patient. Of course, the preference of the patient is most important. From the point of view of registration, we will look at the disease severity and the patient's age. But also, we need to consider other elements such as comorbidities, drug interactions, efficacy of the treatment or potential efficacy of the treatment, and also duration of the efficacy because we want the patient to regrow hair and to keep it, not only to regrow it for once. And also, one of the factors which we'll take under consideration will be the economical factor, in most cases, what the insurance is covering. Currently, the newest recommendations for treatment of Albicariata are the European recommendations, or better to say, the European consensus. So, I will share with you some of the information from this document as well. So, now the two factors that are most important from the perspective of the registration. This is the disease severity and the age of the patient. Regarding the disease severity, we all know that alopecia usually starts with a patch or several patches which then become confluent. The area which is hairless which become bigger, it increases in size, and in up to 20% of patients the alopecia will develop into total alopecia or alopecia universalis. So, when is the moment when we should start thinking about JAK inhibitors? Unfortunately, because of registration issues, to a minor degree, we take into consideration other aspects than the scalp hair loss. We, of course, know that albicariata may be associated with the eyebrow and eyelash loss and with the irritation of eyebrows because the eyebrows and the eyelashes provide protection for the eye. There will be no nasal hair in some of the patients with alopecia This opens the possibility of bacteria and other microorganisms to enter the respiratory system. Some of our patients will have problems with nails. Some may have other comorbidities. Now, unfortunately, these elements are taken into consideration in a minor degree in the current medical approach to treatment with JAK inhibitors. Our main parameter that we take into consideration is the SALT score. And the SALT score means the percentage of scalp hair loss. So if we have a patient who has all hair, all scalp hair, we will say it's SALT 0. If the patient has no hair, it will be SALT 100 and every number in between. Now, how do we do evaluate the disease severity? Well, if the SALT score is below 20, we consider it mild. If the SALT score is between 21 and 49, we consider it moderate and 50 or more is considered severe. Now, what is the indication for systemic therapy? According to the consensus, the European consensus for treatment of alopecia the SALT score of 20 is an indication to start systemic therapy, including the possibility of studying starting JAK inhibitors. However, the registration for JAK inhibitors is for severe alopeciariata. Severe meaning SALT score of 50 or more. Now we want to start the treatment as early as possible for two reasons. First reason is the later we start, the more severe the disease, the poorer the response. And it has been shown, I will show it in a slide in a moment, if the patient has a SALT score of 95 to 100, he or she will respond not as well to treatment as patients who have a lower SALT score. So this is the parameter of severity. The other parameter is the parameter of time. The later we start in time after the start of the most recent episode, the lower the efficacy of the treatment. Now, how do we calculate time? Of course, not in days, not in weeks. Usually, we calculate it in months or even in years. Now, which JAK inhibitors do we have available now? This is Ritlacetinib. It is approved at the dose of 50 mg per day, one tablet per day, for patients who are 12 years old or, or older and for adults. 
and baricitinib. Baricitinib is approved for adults only at the dose, now talking from the perspective of Europe, at a dose of 4 mg, and in some cases we may decrease the dose to 2 mg. In America, the usual way to start would be sometimes 2 mg, and then it can be tightened up to 4 mg. So here the patient's age will be one of the factors that decides about which JAK inhibitors we use, because if it is a child between 12 and 18 years old, then definitely we will use ritlacitinib. If it is an adult, then we can choose between ritlacitinib and baricitinib. There's a third JAK inhibitor that has been recently approved. This is deuroxolitinib. It is approved for adults and it is approved at a dose of 2 times 8 mg per day. So here we take two tablets per day. At the moment when I record this video, it is not available in the United States, even though approved, but as far as I heard, it, will, it should be available very soon. In other countries, this will be probably somewhat later. And here again, looking at the patient's age, the approval is for adults only. We may think why some people do not say jack inhibitors, why they say kinase inhibitors. Well, this has a reason because the JAK inhibitors may influence different kinases, not necessarily only the JAK kinase. These kinases include, of course, the JAK kinases, JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and TIC2, but also the TEC kinases and its isoforms. Now, barcitinib is an inhibitor of JAK1 and JAK2, and to a lesser degree, to of JAK3 and TIC2. Ritlacitinib is an inhibitor, a selective inhibitor of JAK3, and the TEC kinases, and deroxolintinib is an inhibitor of JAK1, JAK2, and to a lesser degree of TIC2, and also of JAK3. Now, how is it possible that ritlacitinib, being a selective kinase inhibitor, that it can inhibit two types of kinases? It is possible because the JAK kinases and the TAC kinases, they share one molecule which is common. This is the cis-909 molecule and it is on JAK3 as well as on the TAC kinase isoforms. So ritlacitinib will be inhibiting these kinases, even though it inhibits only one molecule. Now, from the mechanism of action point of view, the JAK kinases, they will be mainly responsible for the effects of the cytokines, and the TEC kinases, they will be mainly responsible for the effect of NK cells and CD8 plus T cells and their involvement in the pathogenesis of alopecia reata. Now, other factors that we consider when making the choice for JAK inhibitor is the efficacy and how long the patient will keep the hair. This is an analysis which was published recently and I'm showing the approved dosages of these treatments with some evaluation of the possible efficacy. But you will see that in looking at different parameters, these results may look different. But also when you see numbers in the 90s, it doesn't mean that 90% of the patients respond to therapy, unfortunately. The response to therapy may depend, and I'm showing this on this slide for baricitinib, it may depend on the severity of the disease, as mentioned before, and the more severe the disease, the less likely the patient is to respond to therapy. So depending on what subgroup of patients we analyze, the response to therapy and the efficacy may look totally different. In general, the JAK inhibitors in long-term studies, they show an efficacy of up to 64% of patients, including full and partial hair regrowth. What is important to remember that unlike other treatments where we saw a very fast response to therapy, but also many patients lost hair after a while. Here we are looking into a treatment form which needs a lot of time to show the first results. So the hair regrowth may be visible after three months, after four months, after six months, or even later. What I think is important with the JAK inhibitors that most of the patients 
who have a regrowth, they do keep the, their hair long term when they keep being on these JAK inhibitors. Because if we discontinue, and especially if we discontinue too early, the risk of losing hair is very high. Some patients will keep their regrown hair. However, in many patients, there will be a relapse of the disease. So between 89 to over 90% of patients will keep their hair, at least according to studies which are available now, for the time of the treatment, at least. And now how to choose a JAK inhibitor. There are many analyses, including ours, but also this one from the two guys from Spain who are real experts in Lipsheriata. And they have shown that the two drugs which we have available in Europe and the United States and throughout the world, they do show significant efficacy, but at this point it is impossible to define which of these treatment options is best or less good. It depends on the way of analysis and it depends on the factors which are most important for us. However, for all JAK inhibitors, I will underline this again, what is important is long-term maintenance therapy. We may consider whether after full hair regrowth and several months of no relapse, whether we can try to slightly decrease the dose of the JAK inhibitor or whether we want to continue with the dose in which the patient was from the beginning. However, we need to do it very carefully in order to not to lose the effect of the treatment. If this continues too early, then the patient may have a relapse. I will just briefly mention the adverse events. A full list of adverse events is available in the SPC of both medications. Now, in an analysis which we performed some time ago, we have shown that the two most common adverse events of JAK inhibitors, which are used in Alupsheriata, are headache and acne. The acne in most cases is quite mild and topical therapy is sufficient to control the acne. Other adverse events for baricitinib include hypercholesterinemia and for rilacitinib, here are the numbers for the acne and for the headache. Now, we often fear about the possible infections which may be associated with the treatment with immunosuppressive medications. However, we compared the treatment with the placebo and the results we found was that for a baricitinib, approximately 7.3% of patients had infections during the therapy and the number for placebo was 7%. So this was very comparable. For rilacitinib, it was 12.5% during treatment and 12.8% in the group who received placebo. So these differences were not statistically significant. For deuroxaltinib, there is a difference between the treatment and the placebo group. What is important to underline that most treatment emergent adverse events associated with JAK inhibitors, the ones which are available now, baricitinib and rizlacitinib, they are mild to moderate and they are transient. Taking care of the safety of the patients, the EMEA, the European Medicines Agency, issued a statement on measures to minimize the risk of side effects in patients who are receiving JAK1 inhibitors. This is the list of the JAK inhibitors which are on this list. And the European Medicines Agency suggests that these medicines should be used in following patients only if no suitable alternative is available. And these groups of patients include patients who are aged 65 years or older, patients who are at increased risk of major cardiovascular problems, patients who smoke or have done so in the past, and patients who are at increased risk of developing cancer. Also, and I'm reading from the slide, the JAK inhibitors should be used with caution in patients with the risk of venous thromboembolism. I would like to draw your attention to one important fact, the effect of severe alopecia reata on the patient's life. And when you take a look at young people, and alopecia reata is generally a disease of young people, especially in the group of 12 to 17 years, you will say, see that 90% of them claim that alopecia reata influences their life 
either extremely or to a very large extent. The number for adults is a little bit lower, probably they adapt easier, but here also 80% of patients say that the effect of alopecia is in their case either extreme or very large. And when looking at the, the DLQI, I'm not showing the DLQI here, but when looking at the DLQI, you will see that the, the DLQI of patients with severe alopecia areata is approximately 20. This means in numbers, this is twice as high compared to what we consider a high DLQI in patients with psoriasis, which illustrates the extent of the influence of severe alopecia areata on the life and on the well-being of patients who have the disease. Now, important to mention that 62% of patients with alpsiriata say that the disease has a significant influence on their everyday decisions, starting from small decisions, for example, going and seeing friends or attending a party, to major life decisions such as deciding about the job, about the school, but also deciding about private relationships. So in summary, up to 64% of patients have a significant improvement after treatment with JAK inhibitors. Of course, this means that there will be still a group of patients who will not respond to therapy. We may try to switch the JAK inhibitor in these patients, and in some cases this is successful, but also we may hope for the development of new treatment options for those patients who do not respond to therapy. JAK inhibitors have a quite durable effect, but they start working slow. We will see the first effects of treatment after two, three, four months, sometimes significantly longer. Their regrowth usually starts with the eyebrows, eyelashes, and in men with the beard area. The efficacy of treatment is higher in patients who have a shorter disease duration, and it is higher in patients who have a less extensive loss of hair, even within the group of severe alopecia areata. And what is really important to remember, to keep the patients for a long time on maintenance therapy to avoid losing hair that was regrown while the patient was on treatment. Thank you very much. I hope that you found this uh, video useful. If you do, then please give it a like. Feel free to comment or ask questions. Thank you very much.